Danger was lurking around the curve. The Midnight Express was hurtling along at full speed in the middle of the night, and the engineer didn't know that the track had been washed out as a result of a flash flood in a mountain pass ahead. It was in the days of steam before the advent of wireless communication. It was the responsibility of a signalman to stop the train. The engineer didn't get the signal. The train was derailed and many lives were lost, including that of the engineer. It has stood the test of time. God's book, the Bible, still relevant in today's complex world. It is written, founded by George Vandeman, sharing messages of hope around the world. Today, Henry Feyerabend presents two witnesses. After the terrible train wreck, an inquiry was called to determine the cause of the accident. The signalman was called to the stand. Did you hear the approaching train, he was asked? What did you do to warn the engineer of the danger? I waved my lantern back and forth as I stood on the track, he answered, as he demonstrated the motion of waving his hand. When the train kept coming, I got out of the way just on time. The judge came to the conclusion that the engineer had, for some unknown reason, missed a clear signal that he must have fallen asleep. On the way out of the courtroom, the signalman confessed to a close friend. I'm so thankful that there was one question the attorney didn't ask. He didn't ask if the lantern was lighted. I had fallen asleep and was startled by the approach of the train. Oh yes, I waved the lantern, but I didn't have time to light it. The lantern wasn't burning. An unlighted lantern is as good as no lantern at all. Jesus commanded his followers to let their light shine, but in too many cases, the light has gone out. The psalmist said in Psalm 119, verse 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. In the heart of the book of Revelation, precisely at the halfway mark through the book, chapter 11 to be exact, we find a fascinating prophecy predicting the triumph of the Holy Scriptures. Never has a book been so hated as the Bible. Men have denied it, derided it, and attempted to destroy it. They have burned it and wished it out of existence. But through all of this, it has prevailed over its enemies. This amazing chapter of Revelation, Revelation 11, begins with these words in verses 3 and 4. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Though the major part of the scriptures can be taken as literal, the prophetic books, especially the apocalyptic, are highly symbolic. It is not left to the readers to interpret the symbolic terms. The Bible itself gives the keys to understanding figurative language. The witnesses are said to be the two olive trees and the two candlesticks. The two olive trees are clearly defined in the fourth chapter of Zechariah. In verse 4, the prophet sees the two olive trees and asks, What are these, my Lord? The definite answer came, This is the word of the Lord, Zechariah 4, 4 to 6. As we search the scriptures for the meaning of the lampstands, again we find an answer pure and simple. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, Psalm 119, 105. The entrance of thy word giveth light, it giveth understanding unto the simple, Psalm 119, 130. The psalmist, Zechariah, and John on the Isle of Patmos all referred to the Holy Scriptures as a light. Where there is no Bible, there is spiritual darkness. During the Dark Ages, the Bible was a forbidden book. Not only is God's Word described as a light, but also as a witness. 
the word of God testifies. Jesus himself said in John 5, 39, Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Later on, in his Olivet Discourse, Jesus said in Matthew 24, 14, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. In the symbolic language of Revelation, two candlesticks, two olive trees, and two witnesses refer to the Word of God. There are two witnesses, the Old and New Testaments, and both are important. Some people feel that only the New Testament is important to Christians. They don't realize that the Old Testament forms a background for the New. Jesus and the apostles quoted heavily from the Old Testament, and the book of Revelation is filled with Old Testament passages. The Old Testament ends with an unresolved chord, and Jesus Christ came to complete the harmony. Without Him, we could not receive the messages of God's song. The earlier scriptures foreshadow, they hint and suggest, outline, prefigure, illustrate, and promise. The New Testament scriptures fill in the details, flesh out the bones, tint the coloring, fine-tune the picture, and complete the canonical revelation. Someone has appropriately stated that the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, while the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. This prophecy says that for 1260 days, the two witnesses would be clothed in sackcloth, a Bible expression to refer to mourning or obscurity. This same period is referred to at least seven times in the books of Daniel and Revelation. Many Bible students recognize the 70 weeks of Daniel's prophecy to be weeks of years, and by the 13th century, a basis of the theology of the Protestant Reformation had been established as our forefathers accepted the equation of Ezekiel 4.6 and Numbers 14.34, stating that a day in symbolic prophecy represented a literal year. Bearing this in mind, this prophecy provides some amazing proofs as to the accuracy of Bible prophecy. It hardly seems possible that it could be a coincidence that for exactly 1260 years the Bible was in mourning, a book that was in obscurity. During that time the scriptures were hidden in an unknown language, and during that time it was against the laws of the land to read the Bible, the Bible was written by hand, and the common people didn't have access to its writings. Now back to Revelation 11, verse 7. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them and kill them. This 1260-year period of suppression of the Bible would culminate with a series of remarkable events. The Protestant reformers came to the conclusion that this period began in the year 538. It was in that year when, under the reign of Justinian, the state church was given full authority to enforce their religion, and the Bible became a forbidden book. Those who insisted in reading it were persecuted, and millions actually were put to death. Large communities like the Waldenses and the Albigenses were exterminated for the crime of reading the Bible. I have visited the Piedmont Valleys in Italy, where whole communities were slaughtered by the armies commanded by the church. Their only crime? The study of God's Word. The year 538 was the beginning of what many historians refer to as the Dark Ages. It was a time of severe tribulation for true Christians. Matthew 24, 22 talks about such a period and says, it would be shortened for the sake of the elect. The prophecy states that a beast power would attack the two witnesses at the end of the 1260-year period. A beast in prophetic language refers to a political power. See Daniel 7, 17 and 23. This beast would come out of the bottomless pit, or abyss. This suggests an atheistic power with no foundation in God's truth. It represents confusion in doctrines. 
As we compare history with prophecy, we would expect to see a political power attack the scriptures 1260 years after the year 538, or slightly before, as the prophecy said the time would be shortened. As a fulfillment of the prophecy, we would expect to see this happen just before the year 1798. On November 10, 1793, True to the apocalyptic prediction, a nation declared war on the Bible. That day, Bibles were gathered up in Paris, tied to the tail of a jackass, and dragged through the streets of the city. They were piled up and burned as the people cried out, Long live the Republic of France! And anyone who was found with a Bible in his home was condemned to death. At that time, France was dominated with what they called Enlightenment philosophies taught by Jacques Rousseau and Francois Voltaire. Voltaire said that the Lisbon earthquake of 1755 proved that God does not care for us, so we had better look out for ourselves. He rejected the inspiration of the Bible and said that human reason was far superior to Christianity. He especially hated the Old Testament, saying that it reduces human beings to brutes. Another member of the French National Assembly was Thomas Paine, who wrote a book called The Age of Reason. He declared, I strongly detest the Old Testament. Now back to Revelation 11, verse 8. And their dead bodies shall lie in the streets of that great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. It wasn't literally in Sodom, the city by the Dead Sea, nor was it in Egypt that this scene took place. The words clearly state that it was spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. These geographical locations were clearly symbolic. What was there about Sodom that identified it with France during the French Revolution? Sodom was characteristic for moral decay and licentiousness. A study of Paris during the Revolution reveals a strong parallel. Fornication was actually established by law during the period spoken of. Egypt defied the God of heaven. Pharaoh showed his atheism, saying, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. Why does the prophecy say that this is where our Lord was crucified? His crucifixion did not take place in Sodom nor Egypt. There are those who insist that this passage must refer to Jerusalem. Notice, however, that the prophecy says it was spiritually called Sodom and Egypt where our Lord was crucified. Jesus said, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Spiritually, our Lord was crucified anew on the streets of Paris. The motto of the French infidels was, Crush the wretch, the wretch referring to Jesus Christ. France did not and does not have a monopoly on atheism. You can find atheists in practically every country of the world. But France as a nation rejected the word of God and its population celebrated the event. On November 11, 1793, they celebrated the Festival of Reason in the Cathedral of Notre Dame. What had been built as a Christian church became known as the Temple of Human Reason, and they celebrated with prostitution and immorality. And that night, 50,000 people died on the streets of France. The blood ran freely. Surely our Lord was crucified again through His people. During the revolution, Bibles were gathered and burned. Churches and religious institutions were closed. The Sabbath was abolished and a 10-day week was established. Baptism and communion were abolished. The existence of God was denied. Death was claimed to be a perpetual sleep. The goddess of reason was established in the person of a vile prostitute whom they adored. Now reading verses 9 and 10. And they, the people and kindreds and tongues and nations, shall see their dead bodies three days and a half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves, 
and they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on earth. The light of truth had been extinguished. People rejoiced for the darkness. Their conscience was finally assaged. No longer did they have to worry about the Bible and its laws and its restrictions. I'm reminded of a maid in a home who was reprimanded for not doing a good job of cleaning the bedroom. She retorted, when I cleaned it, it was dark and you couldn't see the dirt. It's the sun that has come out that has caused the problem. The Bible was like the sun, showing the filth in the lives of the people. And that is why they were so delighted when the darkness came. But France was filled with horror and terror to the point where those who had fought against the Bible became terrified. The French Revolution was outstanding for its hatred of Christianity and for its violence. During the bloody reign of terror, day after day, for months, as many as 50 or 60 people were decapitated by a falling knife device recommended by Dr. J.I. Guillotine and named after him. Now back to the prophecy, Revelation 11, 11. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood upon their feet and great fear fell upon them which saw them. Now the amazing fulfillment of God's prophetic word. On November 11, 1793, the Bible was abolished by a decree. Exactly three years later, in November 1796, a resolution was introduced giving tolerance to the Bible. But the prophecy didn't say that God's Word would receive new life in three years. It called for three and a half years. The prophecies of the Bible are always precise and dependable. The resolution to give tolerance to the Bible lay on the table for six months without being passed. Then in June 1797, the resolution was passed unanimously, fulfilling three and one half years to the letter. France had made war on all titles and nobility. Their God dishonoring and heaven defying work filled France with such scenes of blood, carnage and horror as made even the infidels themselves to tremble and stand aghast. Now, verse 12. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. In order to understand this expression, we can look at other similar expressions in the Bible. Speaking of the exaltation of King Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel says, Thy greatness is grown and reacheth into heaven, Daniel 4, 22. The two witnesses, the two olive trees, the two candle stands were greatly exalted after the period of mourning that lasted 1260 years. This period ended in 1798 and in 1804, the British Bible Society was organized, then the American Bible Society in 1816. And these societies, with their almost innumerable auxiliaries, are scattering the Bible everywhere. Before 1804, the Bible had been printed in only 15 languages. By the end of December 1942, it had already been translated into 1,058 languages and dialects. And from that time to our day, it has grown fantastically. The British and Foreign Bible Society in one year produced one copy of the Bible every three seconds, 24 hours a day for a year. That was 22 copies a minute or 1,369 copies an hour. They were sent to all different parts of the world in 4,583 cases weighing 490 tons. These Bibles were produced in 1,280 languages. More than 8 million Bibles are purchased in North America every year. Each new translation becomes a bestseller. 
This chapter concludes with a time of trouble when God says the nations were angry and God will destroy them which destroy the earth. Europe would never again be the same after the French Revolution. A British historian said, We are in no position as yet to measure the full impact of the French Revolution on the course of world history. It was one of those decisive events which opened a sluice gate and in the streams it released, we are still swimming, sometimes finding it difficult to keep our head above the waters. Before the French Revolution, wars were fought with mercenary and professional armies. It was in the French Revolution that general conscription became a common practice. Communism is another legacy received from this event. No longer did the majority win. Jean-Jacques Rosa taught that a min minority who know what is best for the people should oppose themselves on the majority for their own good. This chapter of Revelation emphasizes the light that is shed upon the world by the scriptures. The Bible in our hands is an invincible reservoir of power. With it, we can let our light shine, warning the world of its oncoming doom. We can do our part in holding up God's two lamps, His two witnesses, preparing a people to meet their God. As a boy, I enjoyed watching the local blacksmith work using the forge and the anvil. One day I came across a poem comparing the Bible to the anvil and its opponents to the hammers. Thousands of critics have hammered away at the scriptures throughout the centuries. The hammers are gone, the anvil still stands. Last eve I stood beside a blacksmith door and heard the anvil ring the vesper chime. Then looking in I saw upon the floor old hammers worn with beating years of time. How many anvils have you had, said I, to wear and batter all of these hammers so? Just one, said he, and then with twinkling eye, the anvil wears the hammers out, you know. And so the Bible, anvil of God's word, for ages skeptic blows have beat upon. But though the noise of falling blows was heard, the anvil is unharmed, the hammer's gone. For many years, France despised the Bible. When Benjamin Franklin was in Paris, he belonged to a literary society. They had regular meetings, and the members of the society were assigned to write essays which would be read at those meetings. Instead of writing an essay, Benjamin Franklin copied the Bible book of Ruth verbatim. At the meeting, he read this beautiful Bible story word for word. The members of the society were deeply moved, so impressed they were that they insist insisted that Benjamin Franklin have this touching story published. He replied, Gentlemen, the story has already been published. It's a part of the book that you despise, the Holy Bible. Many people despise the Bible because of their lack of knowledge of its true content. The Word of God is powerful, and I have seen it change lives, even of those who hated it. You can count on God's Word. It has stood the test of time, and its message will never, never fail. Sing for joy to the Lord, and joyfully shout to the rock of salvation. Now come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Give praise to the Lord with an hallelujah. Sing to the sing Lord, to the Lord, to the Lord. shout to the Lord. Enter His praises with songs of thanksgiving. Now come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Give praise to the Lord with an Sing for 
Join me now in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, it is good to praise your holy name. We thank you for your word which brings light to our pathway and testifies of your great love to us. May we ever be directed by its message, we pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. The story is told that the atheist and critic Voltaire once bragged that in the near future nobody would read the Bible anymore. But today Voltaire is dead and one of the biggest Bible depositories in the world is built where his house used to stand. There is staying power in the Word of God as today's study in the book of Revelation proves beyond the shadow of a doubt. Maybe you'd like to study the Revelation a little more closely for yourself. So we've prepared a valuable guide to help you. Pastor Henry Feyerabend's book, Revelation Verse by Verse. This important study tool is absolutely free. All you have to do is write or call. So here's the information you need. As a convenience, you may request today's free gift offer by calling our toll-free number at 1-800-253-3000. Remember your gift is sent free and postpaid. Call toll-free from anywhere in North America, 1-800-253-3000. Or, if you prefer, you may request the offer by writing to It Is Written, Box 2010, Oshawa, Ontario, L1H7B4. Once again, our time has run out, and it's time to say goodbye for another week. Join us next week at this same time, and until then, remember, it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Thank you.